welcome everyone. What a wonderful, wonderful crowd. I'm Christine Purvis Johnson, and I'm honored to be the president of Conservation Foundation of the Gulf Coast. Together with presenting sponsor Elizabeth Moore, we are delighted to have you join us today for this very special event with an award-winning naturalist, biologist, and Sarasota native, Dr. Jack Longenow. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your generosity and continued support of our work. Your commitment to conservation fuels our mission. It helps us get more people outside and connected with nature. And we are grateful for your support and continued support always. Thank you. We also want to thank our nature sponsors, whose names you probably saw rotating on the screens, Sherry and Howard Davis, <laughs> Gulf Coast Community Foundation, Sarasota Herald Tribune, Sarasota Scene Magazine, and WUSF Public Media. <laughs> and thank you to all of our sponsors for supporting our mission. Please review the full sponsor list in your program. For those of you who may not know or be familiar with Conservation Foundation, what we do is quite simple. We save land forever. And so far, we've saved a total of 18,887 acres. That's nearly 30 square miles, and we expect that number to keep growing. And it needs to, right? Right? We are in a race against time. With your support, we can save thousands more acres, from Manatee County all the way down to the Everglades, so that we have clean water, abundant wildlife, and special places for kids and adults to enjoy. I know you join me in wanting the next generation, and the next, and the next, and the next, forever, to enjoy the same natural beauty, wildlife, and access to gorgeous places that we have today. We want future generations to be curious and inspired by the world around them, just like Dr. Longino was inspired and curious as a child growing up on his family's ranch. That curiosity grew into a lifelong passion bringing him here today. The Longino Ranch is spectacular for its size, abundant wildlife, and connectivity to over 110,000 acres of protected land known as the Mayaka Island. In 2010, the Conservation Foundation helped conserve over four, almost 4,000 acres of the 8,732 acre ranch by negotiating and the purchase of a conservation easement between the Longino family and Sarasota County, ensuring the ranch's beautiful woods, wetlands, and pastures are protected forever, while at the same time allowing the Longino family to continue their heritage of ranching. That's what we do at Conservation Foundation. We work with private landowners, local, state, and federal governments businesses, and other not-for-profits to accomplish our work for the benefit of people and nature. You can read more about our past accomplishments and projects, as well as our future ones, like the Bobby Jones and rewilding the quad parcels at the celery fields, on our website, conservationfoundation.com. We need to quicken the pace of land conservation. Truly, we are in a race against time as you will hear from today's speaker. But before we bring Dr. Longino to the stage and dive into what is absolutely promising to be a spectacular and informative lecture, let's dive into our lunches and meet a couple more of your fellow conservationists at your tables today. We'll be back shortly to start the program. Enjoy. How valuable land conservation is to our community. Protecting our water, providing food, shelter, and refuge for our wildlife, continuing rural traditions in the face of changing times. 
The work we do at Conservation Foundation has far-reaching impact, and I am proud to serve on the Board of Trustees for such an important organization. I am also proud today to be the presenting sponsor and introduce our special guest, guest speaker. A Sarasota native and passionate supporter of land conservation, Dr. Jack Mongino is professor of biology at the University of Utah. He specializes in tropical insect diversity and has coordinated large-scale biodiversity pro inventory projects in Central America. In 2006, he was awarded the E.L. Wilson Naturalist Award from the American Society of Naturalists. He holds a PhD from the University of Texas, Austin, and a BS from Duke University. Dr. Longino witnessed on his own family's ranch how land conservation can slow humans' negative impact on biodiversity, and he's here today to share his reflections with us. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Jack Longino. Foundation for inviting me today. Um, I hope Christine hasn't brought you here under false pretenses. I'm, I'm not a college speaker. I'm just a college professor. Um, and I'm pretty terrified. <laughs> but I have a lot of slides. I'm going to launch right in. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today in, a, in the next few minutes, I've got a talk of four chapters. I'm going to do the Sarasota setting, then it'll be autobiographical, talk about the construction of a naturalist, um, then a chapter on memory and change, with the changes I've seen, and then the last uplifting chapter I hope on uh, keeping faith. So the Florida setting, the Sarasota setting, this is an illustration of Florida. Um, and if you go on that transect, well, on the top, the lower graph shows a profile of, of Florida, and it's this broad plateau. Um, you can see, so just a little bit of it is sticking out above the water. Um, there are no mountains, there are no river channels, and this little bit sticks above the water, and so very small changes in sea level make big changes in Florida size. Um, we were in an interglacial over the ice ages. Uh, during an ice age, the, it's cold, and all the ice, the water is locked up, and sea level is low, and Florida is big. And then when it melts in these brief warm interglacials, it melts, sea level rises, and Florida gets small. And we're in one of those interglacials right now. Um, the last interglacial was 120,000 years ago. And the white area is how big Florida was 120,000 years ago. And Sarasota and the Longino Ranch is just off the map. So this is what Longino Ranch looked like 120,000 years ago. And so for 120,000 years, this land surface has been above water with very little activity you know, to, to change the land surface. No mountains, no sediments, no, no cutting rivers and so forth. It's been this flat savanna-like habitat for a long time. Um, there were these shallow wetlands that would accumulate water. It probably had standing water for much of the year. It would slowly ooze across the landscape. And then there were natural fires that would start in the dry season, sweep across the landscape, creating a savanna-like habitat. And up until about 11,000 years ago, there were a bunch of big animals roaming around. Things like this extinct giant brown sloth that would have been roaming over the landscape, trashing things and tearing things up. So 13,000 years ago or so, um, 13 to 25, I think, humans arrived. Then 500 years ago, the Spanish arrived, and Europeans in general, and, and colonial powers hated Florida. It was miserable, they, they broke all kinds of dreams. They, they came and then they kept handing it off to each other like a hot potato. Um, like, oh, what flag are we under today? You know, is it Thursday? Uh, but the Spanish did bring a number of things. They brought horses, they brought cows, they brought pigs, they brought citrus, and a variety of other things. 
And so cattle, uh, to consider a uh, replacement for the giant, virtually extinct megafauna, were roaming across the Florida flatwoods for 500 years. Uh, but making improved pastures, that's a recent phenomenon. That's, that's something in the last 100 years or so, and that, because that requires uh, internal combustion. Um, another thing that changed is European started burning in the winter when fires were less intense, and the habitat turned and it became much more tree filled because more trees survived those fires. And then about 100 years ago, um, we started the draining of Florida, massive drainage projects uh, all over the state to sort of drain those Florida swamplands. And in this landscape, which is so flat, um, even a small ditch has this huge effect on the hydro period um, and the nature of hydrology in the region. So let's think of a clock. This land surface has been above water for 120,000 years. So let's say that's a 12 hour clock. Now, well, humans arrived about an hour ago. Um, Europeans arrived maybe three minutes ago. Uh, this massive drainage program happens about 36 seconds ago, and I happen in about 24 seconds ago. So now, chapter two, the construction of a naturalist. Um, this is where I can make it to be autobiographical. Um, so here I am. So back in the uh, 1930s or so, my grandfather and, and in-laws uh, purchased maybe 15 square miles or so of Florida swampland in eastern Sarasota County and ran a turpentine operation. Um, and then I was um, born in 1956. Uh, it, well, the, I forgot a, a stretch. So my father was in World War II. Um, he came back, went to forestry school in Gainesville, uh, inherited this land with uh, his three sisters, my aunts. And they inherited this chunk of Florida swampland, and my father said, well, how about if I can be a cowboy? And started a family corporation uh, with his, his extended family to develop this property as a cattle ranch, and then later citrus. Um, and so I grew up with all of these cousins uh, running around, um, and many of those, and, and this is still a very active um, agricultural operation, and many of my cousins you know, are involved in the, in the management or running of this property, um, and I am deeply indebted to them for, for maintaining the Longino Ranch. Um, now, I'm one of the most fortunate people in the world. I mean, the smartest thing I ever did was to choose these people as my parents and to be born at this time and this place um, in history. Um, and I didn't actually grow up on the ranch. So I grew up in Malik Circle in Sarasota. And um, you know, my father commuted every day out to this eastern Sarasota property. Um, this is Malik Circle, an aerial photo in 1948. It would have been eight years before I was born. Um, and it was uh, a and it was flat woods and pasture. There was an orange grove there, you can see sort of in the middle. I don't have quite, I don't, I can't, I don't have a good pointer really, but anyway, this is uh, Malik Circle in 1974 when I went to college. Um, and so I grew up in this area running around and in the kind of lower left, there was an amazing patch of Florida scrub habitat um, with an incredible diversity of things. And, and I grew up on one of those, one of those houses on Malik Circle. And this is Malik Circle now. Um, and the area has, has changed and developed. Um, but this was my, you know, where I, I started you know, learning, you know, being interested in biology. I, as a kid, I was kind of interested in the creepy crawlies, the snakes and bugs. And, you know, I didn't, and I had this incredible series of people who shaped who I was and opened doors for me along the way. Um, and I can begin with John Hegner in sixth grade, who had us all make an insect collection. Um, Charles Coger at Pineview School was the first grown-up I knew who was a natural historian who was interested in, in turtles and snakes. Um, Ed Taylor at Riverview High School 
uh, talking about the science of ecology and oceanography. Um, Carl Lohr and Cal Dodson at the Selby Botanical Gardens took an interest in me and introduced me to the world of professional science. I went off to Duke University as an undergraduate and came under the influence of Henry Wilbur, a prominent community ecologist. Um, I always wanted to work in the tropics, and I got associated with Larry Gilbert doing research on insect plant relationships in Costa Rica. So I went off to the University of Texas, got a PhD with him. And while I was working in Costa Rica, I came under the influence of, of a, a very famous ecologist named Dan Jansen, who encouraged me you know, to become an important ant ecologist. And I, I worked in this remote national park in Costa Rica, and I, I lived on and off for two years in this tent. And that's where I've, I've lost any kind of social graces or personal hygiene habits that I might have had. Um, but there, I also met an exotic tropical creature, an Alini Nutcarni, uh, who didn't mind my tent or that I didn't wash my clothes. And, and we got married and raised children, um, and then developed careers and went on, and then I became this sort of professional uh, biologist. Um, we worked for many years at the Evergreen State College in Washington State, um, and then about a dozen years ago, we were recruited away to the University of Utah for my biology, um, where we are today. Um, and I, I sort of developed this career as, as an ant expert, and I've done all these uh, inventory projects through Central America, running around in rainforests like I love to do, and have become this, this, this ant expert. But that's not what I'm here to tell you about. Uh, oh, and here's you know, this thing, I became an ant expert. But now I want to move to chapter three, uh, which I call Memory and Change, and these are the changes I have seen since growing up on that circle. That's one of my earliest memories in life, is following the fire plot. Uh, at the ranch, and it was it was amazing. Um, I also, about that time, I remember seeing the one spotted civet cat I've never seen in my life. I've never seen another one. But what there were a ton of were snakes. Snakes were fabulous. Um, at the ranch, you run up, you know, you could see a a, a little pygmy rattlesnake about every fifty feet. Um, diamondback rattlers were scary and around and not super high density. Water snakes, oh my gosh, the band of water snakes. Any body of water had dozens of these things poking up. And everybody knew they were moccasins. Many, many band of water snakes lost their lives by being mistaken for a moccasin. The rat snakes, yellow rat snakes, and just all kinds of things. Um, what's interesting is some of the most fabulous snakes were around Mount Circle, where I grew up, not out of the ranch, because of that patch of, of native uh, scrubland, a little sand ridge. And there, there were speckled king snakes, and other kinds of king snakes, and coral snakes, and green snakes, and a coach whip. And the one time in my life, I've seen this eastern uh, pine snake, which is now an endangered species. At that time, the really rare, you know, wonderful, and amazing thing to find was the blue indigo snake, the largest snake in the eastern United States. And, and these things um, were always low density, and it was super wonderful when you find them. Um, Snakes are basically gone. I mean, it's interesting that indigos still seem to be about at their old density. I still find them about the same rate I used to, but nothing else. I mean, the, the snakes have almost completely disappeared. They're very rare. Uh, this is the last diamondback rattlesnake I saw, um, which was maybe 15, 20 years ago um, in the back of someone's truck. Frogs. Um, so there's still plenty of, of frogs around, but when I was a kid, there were frogs. And out of the ranch, the houses at the ranch were dripping with the green tree frogs. They were crammed into every crevice. Uh, the green animals, they're still around. They're just lower density, uh, but they used to be really abundant. We would clip them to our earlobes and walk in and freak our mothers out. <laughs> you know, garfish were floating you know, under, just under the surface in any body of water in large numbers. Uh, these, these freshwater mussels, you know, filled the sand of those wetlands. Now, these things, all much lower density. I've rarely seen them in my, you know, the ranch. Quail. Quail used to burst out of the palmettos and scare me to death in these big flocks. And that doesn't happen anymore. And, and, um, whippoorwills. You know, and certain times of year, you hear whippoorwills at night. 
And I think they were the same as the things people call tollbacks. In my childhood, I remember seeing, you know, driving at night at the ranch, and these reflective eyes would look at you and then fly up on the road, and they were bullets. And I think they were whippoorwills, but they don't seem to be there anymore. Plants, in the world of plants, um, the, the strangler fig, like I said, used to be quite common on the ranch, there's lots of them. Um, I did find a single and unknown flavor of uh, plant in a hammock, the pod, the Everglades pod apple, and also a single Eugenia plant, the white stopper. These kind of tropical elements. There were a lot of tropical elements in the ranch, then. Um, including this Everglades butterfly, the red dagger wing, whose caterpillar is each of the strangler figs. Um, so this is exciting. And then, of course, there were praying mantises. And in high school, that was a total praying mantis nut. Uh, they really excited me. I, I tried to learn all about them. And there was the grizzled mantis in the upper left, this amazingly camouflaged thing on both trunks and totally flat. Um, the, the grass mantis, um, that upper center one, was super abundant. And they were just everywhere. And their little egg cases were on every window screen. Um, the Carolina and Florida mantises up and right, and then the little ornaments that went around, the little Mantoida mantis and the leaf litter. But the prize, the really cool one, was the little right Ronaria borealis. This, this incredible mantis where they were only, it's partly genetic, only females known, they were wingless, um, and just a really cool mantis. I don't see mantises at all anymore. I haven't seen a mantis in decades in, at the ranch. Um, I, they're gone. Uh, other big insects that attracted me as a kid, there were these big shiny beetles. This is a, a longhorn beetle that specializes on Pumelium, one of the shrubs, tropical shrubs out there. Um, it's, you know, these are still around, sort of. Uh, the, the zebra swallowtails are great. They lay eggs on the, on the pawpaws and the, and the flatwoods and the graves of caterpillars. This is one of my favorite weapon plants, Thalia geniculata. And the inflorescences are always covered with this specialized uh, bug that, that is a herbivore, feeds on the inflorescences and seeds of, of this plant. You know, and I don't see something of those around. Anymore. And our moth, this this was not taken at the ranch, it was taken in Guatemala, but um, but nevertheless, this sort of phenomenon would happen, and, and they would eat moths at lights in the windows, and you put the light at night in the woods, and there'd be a ton of moths. And that just doesn't happen anymore. So this is my lab at the University of Utah, and those cabinets are basically filled with the world's ants, and, and, and I'll spend time extracting DNA from these ants. But over in the corner, there's that insect cabinet, and that's the insect cabinet that I show people, you know, who come to visit the lab, and that's what I call the gee whiz book. And these are things I've collected starting with my high school collections here in Sarasota. And so they're showing beetles and stuff, and, and I can't point to it, but one of those Things the rhinoceros beetle that I that were common behind the house in the rock circle that I collected there. Um, little shiny dung beetles, and on the right is my praying mantis and cockroach drove. And there are the grizzled mantises I collected in high school. You know, there are the Florida and Carolina mantises I collected in high school. And there are those grass mantises you know, that, I, that I collected when I was, when I was in high school. Um, and it would be very hard for me to recreate this collection. And I, 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 I don't, I couldn't do it. Couldn't find this. Okay, and so now I want to tell you about you know, some other things that changed and happened during the time from when I was, you know, in, in grade school until now. I'm going to start with a little, you know, thing about causation correlation, which is one of the most difficult problems in science. How we automatically you know, assume causation for things when, when really what it's a, a lot of correlation and it's a real challenge to say, okay, what actually causes things? And yeah, this would be you know, so a simple example of that phenomenon of, you know, purchase of ice cream and it's correlated with getting sunburns, but we don't think that purchasing ice cream causes a sunburn or that getting a sunburn causes you to go buy ice cream. There's some other factor that's influencing both of those in the same. Nevertheless, these are the things that have happened over time. And one of them is massive freezing. Um, and you know, this on the left, on the left is the 1985, you know, giant freeze, mainly reflected in losses of citrus crops. And then 1989, was the Christmas freeze of 89, you know, massive citrus crop loss. And I was here, and this is the day after that freeze when the ice on the puddles at the ranch and and Nalia and I did a walk around the ranch, and, and things have dramatically changed. All those tropical elements have, have frozen. 
And this is a big straggler thing that I went to every year for a long time to the 70s and, and 80s. And, and this was on the right is the day after the freeze. And, and this particular tree is, is now gone. Um, another thing that happened was reduced burning, even though my father loved to set the woods on fire, and I did too. Oh my God. Um, I love fire. And, but, but nevertheless, it, it got harder and harder and harder to, to maintain a really rigorous burning program. Um, and so this is aerial photos of the ranch from 1957 on the left. A lot of the ranch was this open palmetto prairie. Uh, same area in 1994, you can see a thick layer of, of pine trees has grown in in that same area. Another thing um, that is you know, sort of different on landscape is fertilizer. You know, what, you know, this, this sort of, you know, we live on these sterile sands, and, and to grow any cows on a pasture, you have to fertilize. So I remember the fertilizer trucks, you know, going over the improved pastures, spreading nitrogen everywhere, dramatically increasing the nitrogen budgets of our ecosystems. And then, of course, this would move across the whole landscape, uh, being moved by cows. And then introduced various introduced species. Uh, pigs. Pigs were introduced 500 years ago, but for some, somehow it seemed like in the 60s they were super abundant. Um, and it had a population explosion. Armadillos. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that armadillo, the native range, went to the Mississippi River, and then in the mid-1900s they crossed the Mississippi. And then they exploded in Florida. And when I was a kid, you couldn't walk without tripping over armadillos. And they were everywhere. Um, the fire ant was introduced. Uh, from Argentina, and that became everybody's number one you know, public enemy, terrible pest, found your toes, I hated fire ants. Um, and then um, we had the aerial spraying of myrids, a powerful insecticide that was then aerially broadcast across the entire state. And I remember standing in the backyard of Alex Circle as this bomber flew overhead and then hearing the sprinkle of the little myrids pellets sprinkling down onto, this, onto the pavement. So those are things you know that happen. Um, now, not everything declined. We have some things that have increased in abundance over those, those years, um, mostly introduced species. One of them is the brown anole. Um, Cuban anole was introduced, became super abundant. Um, you know, we know all these plants, Brazilian pepper, uh, coconut grass, soda palms, maluca, all these, all these kind of things we hate. As, as invaders. Um, one thing that and it's an interesting change is when I was a kid, there were no deer at the ranch, none. And now they are quite abundant. Okay, chapter four, last chapter, uh, keeping faith. So this thing about insect decline, this, this seems to be a real thing. Uh, this was a colleague of mine, Dave Wagner, he and some authors of uh, published this paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a, a year or two ago. Um, uh, and it was you know, kind of assessing, a, documenting that we do have this insect decline that's happening all over the world, and we don't really know why. And there's no single smoking gun. And they you know, titled it Death by a Thousand Cuts. And there's just a whole lot of environmental insults that are happening, and including a number of those things that I just talked about. And it, you know, it gets into the media, and you know, you know, and this collapse, the insectageddon. Uh, Florida figures prominently in those media accounts, you know, because everybody remembers that when we, at least my age remembers, that if you drove to Gainesville, you had to stop every now and then to clean all the bugs off your windshield, and you don't have to do that anymore. But actually, when I think about this, the bugs we mainly had to clear off the windshield were love bugs. They came in and were an introduced species that became super abundant. And, and that doesn't seem to happen much anymore. Okay, so with all this gloom and doom, you know, what do we do? You know, do we just give up? Um, and I say no. Uh, we need to look forward. Um, and now, again, yeah, I like to philosophize. And, and, you know, teach ecology. And I always go back to these two guys. Uh, Democritus, you know, uh, Democritus is credited with inventing the concept of the atom, you know, that the underlying reality there is are these eternal fixed units, um, and there's a, a structure you know, to the universe, um, and the universe is sort of like this this machine. Um, and then there's the other guy, Heraclitus, and he's the one who is credited with saying you can never step into the same river twice. That everything is change, everything is chaos. Um, a rather grim view of, of reality. 
and, and these kind of different, I can say I'm firmly in that miraculous camp, um, but you know, these, these different threads of thought have been there for a long time, and there are in ecology, and part of ecology, you know, and a lot of we try to think of ecosystems as these elaborate machines. And we've broken them, you know, we've broken a machine, and so now we need to fix the machine and, and, and get it back to the way it was. Um, but I don't think the machine is a good metaphor for these things. It, it, everything has changed, and we have to deal with that. And, you know, so we can't go back and, and recreate some, some glorious past when, when all the big bucks were out there running around with lots of snakes. And, it's going, to, it's going to be hard to do that. Um, but this is, you know, what's interesting to me is just a couple days ago, I'm preparing for this talk, there's this thing called iNaturalist where people can take pictures of things they see and post them and people identify them. And I looked up the runner's mantis, my favorite thing, and these are all the recordings of runner's mantis from the last you know, few years. So they're still here. You know, they're scattered around. They're just much lower density. And so the, and these ranch lands, you know, it's all about relative abundance. You know, the things are are not necessarily going extinct. They just don't look like the way they used to, or don't have the abundance they used to have. And these ranch lands are still teeming with, with life. You know, I can still go out and see the, the, the heliconius, the, the zebra butterflies clustering up to sleep together at night. And, and if you go walk in the flatwoods right down here, you might get to see a pine lily. So what are the major threats? You know, what you know, what do we have to do going forward? And, and so I've got a number of recommendations um, that might be somewhat controversial, I don't know, but, but, uh, but I feel like the number one enemy is, is just land clearing. You know, the fact that and, and Florida has no natural protection. You know, it doesn't have rocks. You know, I grew up without any rocks to throw at kids. Um, and it doesn't have any topography to impede things. And you can take a 120,000 year old surface and, and clean it off in, in an afternoon. Recover. Um, but now, exotic species. Um, I feel like we may oh, we get a little overzealous sometimes in controlling exotic species. Uh, there's this pattern with, where exotic species arrive and they have an explosion, and it seems like the world's going to come to an end, and everything we know is going to die, all going to become one thing. Um, and so we're determined to, to get rid of this thing. But if you just leave it alone, after about 20 years, they tend to get less abundant. They never go away, they just fade into the background. Um, and I've seen this happen with armadillos. They're not nearly as abundant as they used to be. Um, fire ants are not as abundant as they used to be. Um, and so I do I'm concerned about, these, about the use of large scale kind of chemical control of exotics. And uh, I would prefer that we got a little less freaked out about the exotic control. Um, use of fertilizers. You know, this is probably having a big effect on things. Um, and I'm, I think it's just if we could kind of minimize the fertilizer use in general, that would be good, and agrochemicals agri in general. Um, restoring hydro periods. You know, I have this, you know, this idea that maybe you know, part of the impact of those freezes is because the hydro period has been so changed that if, if Florida had more standing water, there would be a lower effect of, of, these, of these hard freezes. Um, so this is our mitigation bank at, at, at the Lajno Ranch. You know, where we, you know, it's a, a large wetland that was ditched probably in the 1960s or so, and that we you know, burned and are you know, trying to reestablish a natural hyper period in this large wetland. And then, of course, my a recommendation is, is to burn, baby, burn. And I, this is so hard to do in, in today's world and in our kind of risk averse everything. Um, but the more fire she can set, the better. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, I'm going to you know, put a last closing statement here, you know, um, is, you know, we can set aside these areas. It's what you all do, and it's fabulous, you know, that, that retain, you know, a diverse assemblage of animals and plants. And we can be mindful of the processes that shape those lands, and we can try to minimize the changes to the basic building blocks of those ecosystems. And if we do that, our children may still be able to walk through a diverse small prairie. And um, maybe even find
find a, a broader stand that's so thank you. We have to take any any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Longinot. That was an amazing lecture, and we really appreciate your personal remembrances and your comments for what we might be able to do in the future. I'm Rhonda Deems. I am the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Conservation Foundation, and I really appreciate you all joining me here today. Thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you to Elizabeth for helping us arrange have Dr. Longino here. We are um, so grateful for all of your support. Um, I also want to help uh, ask for your help in supporting our mission. Our mission, of course, is to conserve land for the benefit of people and nature. And if we're thinking about what can we do going forward, how can we all um, come together to help, one way is to support uh, the Conservation Foundation. We must, we must save these special places. I think this is a very eye-opening discussion about um, the impact that we are having on our environment. What can we do? We can help to conserve the land for the benefit of nature and to, to enhance the biodiversity, safeguard our water supply, and ensure that future generations have access to the same natural places that we do today. Dr. Longino's story and science gives evidence, credence to the need that we need to help conserve this pro these properties. Please help us to make uh, the places to quicken the pace of conservation. We have donation envelopes on your tables today and uh, staff is ready to help you if you would like to make a, a donation via credit card. If you'd like your gift matched, we have the ability to help you with uh, the Flanser matching program. That's an amazing program that will can, uh, match up to $500 a month. And there's a QR code on your, on your uh, tables that will help you do that. It's a, an extremely important thing that we are doing and it's, um, uh, tragic to think that we may be missing the opportunity to help uh, save our natural places. So thank you so much for coming out today, for supporting our work, and uh, thank you again Dr. Longino and the Longino family for your efforts in conserving your property.